You're listening to To Hatchapod with Key Budge, Corey Costello, and Greg Garrett. To Hatchapod time again, Key Budge, Corey Costello. Corey, how are you? I'm, I'm fantastic. Thanks so much for having me back again. Well, you're always welcome back. That's right. I should be. My name's on the marquee somewhere. Yeah. Ashley begs to differ, but yeah. that's another story. <laughs> but, you know, Corey, the last few weeks, we can really tell that summer is here. And we really see a lot of activity pick up after the first few months, the last few months of winter. We get into spring, it starts picking up. And then summer, bam. Yeah. It's just intense busy between events, projects. You've got budget. Yeah. All of these things all come at the same time. Yeah, you kind of want to start with, you know, the the mark for the beginning of summer in this job is is budget as you as you referred to. We have a fiscal calendar which is July 1 to June 30. So you kind of want to cue that uh, you know, it's the most wonderful time of the year, Christmas carol, uh, that uh, that happens because it consumes a lot of us for a good amount good amount of time. And today we wanted to talk about the budget for the upcoming fiscal year 22-23. And it, we had a budget hearing workshop that mm-hmm. took place this week. We presented to council. Council approved that budget, and we are ready to, you know, end the last fiscal year. Yeah. But I think it's really important that we talk about this upcoming fiscal budget, mm-hmm. and we project into the next five years. Yeah, we adopt an operating budget for the next fiscal year, and then we project. We have a preliminary budget that gets adopted four years out, so five years total, just to allow. Let you really see trends of what's to what to expect, and we, you know, it's a, it's a budget, so you best sort of guess uh, what your revenues are going to be, where the money's coming in, what your expenditures can be, and of course, we have mid year revisions that we make every year as well. But uh, that's kind of how we do it. Some cities just go with uh, one one year at a time. Some go with a five year like ours. Um, you know, I know the County of Kern has a really interesting budget process. They adopt the preliminary just to get rolling, and then they come back and finalize it. The state does a similar concept. So uh, ours is a little more simpler, but it allows us a little more planning with a five-year sort of preliminary budget. And this is something that we started months and months ago at each of the departments and looking to project what the needs were and start to plan, make those plans. Which staff has started to refer to as the hunger games. Yeah, Uh, You know, people come in and they, everybody wants stuff because they want to grow what they do and provide better service. And then you always have to look at it and run the numbers and say, Okay, that's not going to work. Let's figure right. out what what is feasible for us, and that's how we how we work. And everybody works together, uh, great. And uh, you know, everyone's been a lot very, very reasonable with what actually they they think you know is needed in their department to to move forward and provide the best service to the residents. So, with today's conversation, we want to welcome in Hamid Jones. Welcome to Tehachapi. I mean, you are our chief financial officer, the finance director here at the city of Tehachapi, and you've been here just a few months. But uh, we welcome you, first-time guest on the show. First time. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And, and he might be the last time because he's he might quit because he's so <laughs> nervous to be on the podcast. He's like, this wasn't in the job description. I was never told I had being, a podcast. Yeah, being on podcast and media is not <laughs> something that probably in your field that you thought, that's going to be in my future. Right, right. I mean, it was an adjustment just having to do the council meetings, you know, give presentations. That's one thing, you know, you're out in public, but not this type of uh, uh, genre, I guess you'd yeah. say. Yeah, and Hamid came to us uh, from Bear Valley Springs and prior to that, City of Palmdale. So has experience on the on the special district side, the city side. And so, uh, you know, lived in Tatchby. We were very lucky to, to, to snag him. And Frankly, steal him away. Let's just say that right there. You know, he's, uh, he's a UCLA Bruin alumni, too. I couldn't tell. I know. <laughs> I could not tell. Never. We, we tease because his office is filled with different UCLA memorabilia. And where's the uh, the blue and gold very proud? <laughs> I do. I do. I'm, I'm probably a little bit of a nut job when it comes to that. But uh, staff, my staff, they've already learned. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of know now not to bring me anything red. They've even talked about, you know, eliminating red folders, stupid stuff like that. <laughs> but, um, but I, it's, it's stuff you probably gave a, a, a half a second of consideration. That's not a bad yeah, idea. Yeah. Bad yeah idea. I mean, <laughs> I, I tell them I'm joking, but there is a part of me that probably appreciates the fact that they're already thinking like me. I'm already training them. There think, you go. I think the first week on the job, I walked <laughs> into his office. He didn't have all of his stuff in there quite yet. And I'm like, but the first thing I said, 
well, of course you have Coach Wooden's Pyramid of Success hanging up. I should have known. Like yeah. th- that is pretty much you get a diploma at UCLA and you get a copy of Coach John Wooden's, you know, Pyramid of Success. So take this with you on your future endeavors. <laughs> there you go. Let's kind of dive into the budget here. And 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 one of the things that I think when we had the workshop that I liked is we had members of the media there that was asking questions mm-hmm. and we held this workshop to talk about the budget and did so in a setting that the the reporter was able to ask questions from the audience and get answers. And it was the dialogue back and forth to make sure people understood. I thought it was it was just a nice, relaxed atmosphere to present numbers, talk about the minutia of, of how we do things, and that interaction, which I haven't seen in the past, not because we haven't had a relaxed setting, but because we haven't had reporters attend. Yeah. So it was nice to actually see the media there and engage. And you were able to answer questions, and Greg was able to answer questions. Council had questions. But now this is our audience's turn who wasn't able to be here. So let's explain and break down what we're looking at as far as the city of Tehachapi's budget for the upcoming year. Where are we at? I guess we can start with just like explaining maybe the different funds, right? Our overall general fund and then... What sort of comprises the budget would be a good spot to, start, to start. I think first, let's ask, do we have a balanced budget? We do have a balanced budget. Okay, good. Check that box. Check box. <laughs> okay, good. Now, the overall budget, where is that? How much is, is that that we're talking about? So like Corey said earlier, so the 22-23 budget next year, um, overall expenditures, it's at $33 million. Um, and then we also adopt preliminary budgets for the four years after that. So the four years after that, there is a drop. It goes back down about 26, 27 million each year. And the main reason in this next fiscal year that we're higher is because of the airport fund. So we've got some grant funding, um, a big project there for the taxi relocation. And so that's kind of boosting the overall expenditures as well as the revenue numbers up next year. And then it kind of goes back down to what we typically see at about 26, 27 million per year. Okay. And we have, and in that revenue budget, it should be pointed out too, we have the general fund, which is about $12 million. Um, the airport has a seven and a half million, about 7.6 million this year, uh, due to that grant being a big part of that. Uh, water operates at about 5 million, sewer at two and a half. Uh, there's a capital projects portion that comes in, that's 2.3 million. Um, some of these funds like water, sewer, trash, the transit, airport these are uh, these are enterprise funds so it's pretty much money in money out it's kind of a rate payer system uh the airport does receive a few subsidies they did this year because of the grant when you see the number of like 34 million dollars it's not like all that money's coming in we just get to figure out okay where where we're going to send all of this a lot of it's sort of because of the enterprise fund sort of allocated in advance it has to go towards and when you pay your water bill that money stays in the water fund to deliver water to your home we don't take the water fund and go pave a street with it. That's not not that's right. not legal. You can't do that. So uh, that's where those enterprise funds. So I think people, see, if you see a big number, it's not just like oh, it's thirty five million of discretionary funds to spend wherever you like. That's not the case. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, when when you talk about the enterprise funds, they're supposed to be self sustaining and they're more restricted for the purpose of those funds. Um, general fund is your discretionary spending. So that's where your property tax revenue, your sales tax revenue, you know, those come into the general fund and then it's up to the council to decide where to spend that money. Um, and so some of the, the key general fund, you know, departments, um, your, your number one department is going to be police. You know, that's general fund funded and uh, that makes the biggest part of that. And then we've got the fire contract, you know, and then all your other general government services from there. And that general fund, 12.2 million this year. So the revenue that makes up the general fund and Hamid pointed out to a little bit, uh, sales tax makes up about 30. It's the biggest chunk. It makes up 33 percent of that. That's about four million dollars projected this this year. And how are the on the sales tax? How are the projections because we sort of project this year's budget based on last year's numbers and and then you project the four years out based on so how do you sort of I guess budget for sales tax, especially that being such a huge part of the general fund revenue? What's kind of your you know your theory when you think about uh, you know budgeting in the future and what the trend's going to look like? So with sales tax, you know we do have a consultant, sales tax consultant that uh, we get quarterly reports on um, so they can give us some some real data about what the numbers are looking like. Um, so not only the past few quarters, but then kind of a projection of what they're seeing 
as far as the different sectors. Um, and so, for example, you know, fuel sales is is what's really driving our current year sales tax up and where we're seeing the biggest increase because of the higher gas prices. So, you know, we get a lot of information from them. You know, they give us some numbers. Now, we don't always go with their numbers. They can sometimes, you know, maybe be a little bit more rosy. Um, you know, we yeah. tend to be conservative when we're looking at these. And so we, we definitely take their numbers into consideration. But we'll also look at our actual numbers, kind of compare them to well, how do we do the same quarter last year? Yeah. You know, and we'll, we'll take, you know, little projections like that and, and increases, decreases and apply it. And, and then again, you know, you try to look to the future and what the economy looks like and, you know, with inflation and other things. And, you know, you factor all that in. And, and again, it's, it's a projection. You're never going to be 100% accurate, but we try to be as accurate as we can. Yeah. And I think uh, that's important to point out that the sales tax piece is about $4 million. I think it's assumed a lot of time that property tax is, is a big, you know, uh, people think that really pays. And California has limitations on, on property tax allocate on, uh, you know, how much basically you can, uh, your property tax you can provide to a home. It's a, it's, it's the prop 13. You hear that term th- thrown around, but I mean, that's a, that's, that's actually less. There's, there's less in property tax, which makes up 12% of the general fund than vehicle license fee revenue that comes into the city, uh, which is your car tags. And there's a portion of that comes to the city and uh, that's 1.6 million and, uh, and unsecured property tax is 1.4 million. So that's actually uh, third on the list. And then we have some other revenues that come in, um, our transient occupancy, occupancy tax, which is also your hotel tax here. It's, it's, uh, about 8% and that actually ends up making up 8% of the, of the budget at just under a million dollars. And, uh, there's a few other fees that get popped in there, but those are the sort of the big threes. And the big one this year that helped us balance things out it was made, it was, uh, put in to make up for losses of the last couple of years due to COVID was the, uh, the American rescue plan act. Is that the right acronym for ARPA? I think close you're enough. Right. Yeah, I, think I say it fast enough. Yeah. It's right. <laughs> uh, and so that was a million and a half dollars. Talk about that funding a little bit. Cause that was sort of, it was confusing from the jump, honestly, because there wasn't a lot of guidelines, but, uh, how is that funding being used? Yeah. So, so just a little history on that. So when that first came out, there was a lot of confusion of, was it going to be restricted? How was it going to be used? Um, and, and really, uh, you know, it was what the city and a lot of other small cities wanted to use it for was to replace lost revenue. Yeah. Um, and at first you had to do calculations, you know, you had to, to show how much revenue was lost. And then they came out uh, back in January, they revised their methodology and said, look, like if it's under 10 million, you can take a standard allowance. You can just claim all of that as your revenue loss. You don't have to show us your calculations. So it kind of eased the burden on cities yeah. um, in collecting that money. Um, and so it kind of changed the way we had that budgeted. In previous year's budget, we weren't sure when we were going to get it. So we kind of cleaned that up a little bit at our mid-year budget. Um, and now we know what we're getting. And in fact, we've already gotten half of it. So uh, to Hatchby's allocation was 3.1 million. Uh, half of that, you know, a little over 1.5 million, we received last fiscal year, um, and now we are planning on receiving the next 1.5 million in July. And so, uh, you know, we plug that into the budget in next fiscal year. Um, that really helps the general fund. It actually, you know, helps us balance this yeah. next year. But it's just one-time funding. Um, it's really going back into our reserves um, or our fund balance. Um, and then we're just trying to be prudent and making sure that uh, if we do have one-time revenues like that, you know, that it's it's used to either fill fill reserves, fund balances, or used for one-time expenses. We're not using it to pay for ongoing operating expenses. And that's, you know, best practices. Is, is, and it's, in fact, it's in our financial policies. So that's what we're following. And we use that policy, I think, on, across the board on a lot of things. Um, you could, and I know some cities, for better or for worse, would take took their ARPA funds and they were going to go build statues or whatever it was and they were doing things but those are things that also required maintenance in the future and then that revenue is going to go away and so we talk about this really ARPA aside all the time when it's building something how are we going to maintain it how are we going to fund you know Greg's done a great job he says it all the time when someone has a I got a great idea for something and it's okay awesome we can build it but how are we going to maintain it there's there's I maybe mean, there's not funding there. And so I think that's important across our financial policy and just how we do business in general to always think about one-time stuff is nice, but it's not sustainable. Yeah, that, that's a real important thing to do. When, whenever you have these big capital projects or parks or anything like that, 
you want to make sure you're considering your ongoing operating costs, just like you said. And, and, um, and in fact, when we submit, you know, our budgets for awards, um, you know, to a couple different agencies, that's one thing they like to see in your budget document is evidence that you are considering the ongoing operating impacts and not just the one-time initial costs. Hamed, let me ask you about our reserve balance. When we look at the budget, the revenue budget is $34 million and $39,000 coming in. We're anticipating some $33 million $328,000 that are going out in expenditures. So we've got a little bit of a surplus. What happens with that surplus? So really not just a surplus, but even just what we call our pooled cash. You know, we, we at all times are going to have cash on hand, whether it's in our checking accounts or investment accounts, um, because there's a timing, there's cash flow. And so one of the things you want to do with your investments is you want to look at the cash flow. You want to look and see, okay, what are our high points, our low points historically? And that's one of the first things I did when I got here was just to see, okay, how much money do we have kind of sitting? Yes, it's in an investment account. Uh, we typically invest in a state local agency investment fund. And it's very safe. It's very liquid. We can pull money whenever we want. But it doesn't earn that much interest. And in fact, the interest rate had really plummeted over the last couple of years. So if you can improve on that by, you know, maybe examining your cash flow and seeing what do we not need to have on hand over the next few months, you can go out and invest that in still safe investments like treasury bonds or agency bonds or CDs. We can't go beyond five years anyways. We're restricted by California government code. So, but by doing that, you can get a better rate of return and so that's a part of your investment policy, your investment plan is just being active in that, monitoring your cash flow and, and just investing that excess surplus cash. Um, and then as long as you know that, you know, you're not going to need to sell those investments early um, because you, you know you don't need that money for a few years. So, um, you know, and the other part of that, too, is, you know, with with our budget and, you know, revenues can be can be difficult to increase. Um, you know, you're, you're always looking for things, ways of increasing your revenues because our expenditures, you know, are always, you know, tend to go up, um, especially with inflation right now. So, you know, by looking at this type of plan and being a little bit more active, you know, we're able to increase our interest revenue. Um, we're looking at with the first um, kind of kickoff, we, we took four million and invested it. Um, and we're looking to increase our revenue by about 77,000 per year. So if we can continue doing that, expand a little bit more, we can keep keep building on that and, and generate a little bit more revenue to to help. And it should be noted too that it's not there's a lot of specific requirements on the investments. It's not like you know it's not like I'm sitting around a day trading uh, with the city's money every day. Like right. you just you can't do that. You can't just get the hot stock tip and and throw money at that. <laughs> there's there's a lot of requirements and regulations around what can be invested, how it's invested, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So it's not just you're out here playing Wall Street. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of regulations behind it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there there's there are three parts of our investment policy. I mean, safety is the number one priority. Liquidity is number two, and then number three is your return. Um, but yeah, so you're totally restricted. We can't play the stock market. We can't do futures or derivatives or anything like uh, that. It's, it's safe and boring investments. Cryptocurrency, but none of that no, stuff. No, yeah. no, definitely not. But. <laughs> but it was an opportunity to take this money and in, reinvest it to have a little additional cushion. We, we saw uh, to increase our revenue, mm -hmm. you know, based on the revenues that we've come in, there's a, there was a chance to increase that and you took that opportunity. Absolutely. I mean, every, every little bit helps. It doesn't take a lot of extra time. It's to me, I view it, it's part of the position, um, you know, just getting a sense of that cash flow and, and what we see coming in and going out and, and put that money to work a little bit. You know, and there's, we bring this stuff up and we did, we have kind of talked about the, the positive parts so far. Uh, let me bring the show down for a moment. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a balanced budget and there was a slight, you know, bit of a surplus projected for, for this year. But if you go into our, our budget that was presented, um, there was a, a very good article written in the attachment news by Claudia Elliott, who was there, uh, pointing, out, kind of t recapping the meeting. Um, there was a, there's a lot of challenges. If you look past next year's budget, 
there's a projected deficit. And there was a lot of challenges. You heard us talk about it on this show, a lot of unfunded mandates from the state. We're investing heavily in the police department because, frankly, the state's not locking people up. But it doesn't mean the residents of Tehachapi should suffer. And so, um, you know, I think Chief Krager said on this program, uh, a lot of people don't think you can arrest your way out of a problem. Well, I'm going to keep trying, <laughs> you know, and, and that's what the Tehachapi Police Department is doing. So we've invested in them. We've, we've hired additional officers, uh, additional support staff, uh, additional sergeants, and that sort of thing to, to put more officers on the street and get them equipment as well. But you've got a, a, other unfunded mandates coming down from the state, making us replace equipment and that sort of thing. Um, do you do air quality regulations and that sort of stuff, some unfunded pandemic costs, but a big part of it, um, with, with all this other, and then of course the rising costs of everything, just because we may be getting a little more sales tax revenue because gas is so high to turn around and deliver you services is, is more expensive to put fuel in the vehicles that the public works team and PD drives around is more expensive. So there's not like there's a huge windfall here because this is all going right back out to the community. But, uh, you know, the big one we've talked about in the past has been the fire contract. Um, you know, we are a, a recipient of contracts service from Kern County fire and that contract value right now, uh, as, uh, as of last year was 726,000 roughly that was total that be in, and that was about 700, and uh, about 700000 and change from allocated property tax, which was set aside for fire. It's on your property tax bill. It's kind of referred to as the fire fund. And the arrangement the city had with the county was they'd get the fire fund and we'd give them, you know, there was another small payment on top. Well, when that contract expired, they went out and uh, they wanted to increase their revenues and their, because of their operating expenses and the way they do things. And they drastically increased that. So not only were they getting this fire fund, now they've asked for more out of our general fund, uh, which grows quite a bit. So the total contract cost will go from 726000 last year to $2.1 million in 27-28. And then the payment from the general fund, which was about 19000 last year, projected to be about 196000 this coming fiscal year, will jump to $1.27 million in 27-28. What are the increases in percentages on those, Hamid? Because those are pretty big. So on the overall contract cost, as Corey said, going from 700000 to $2.2 million, I mean, that's a two, over 200% increase over six years. So that's the total cost of the contract. And then when you look at that extra payment that the city's going to have to make from the general fund going from 18,000 to 1.3 million, that's a 6,700% increase over six years. I mean, you're, you're multiplying by 67 times <laughs> what we just, what we just paid. Wow. I mean, and that's, that's astronomical. I mean, that's, that's a huge increase. And so that, that really is kind of driving in our general fund, you know, we were balanced this next year, but you know, and that really mainly from the ARPA funds that we got, you know, really helping that. But when you go out those four additional years, um, you know, we, we, we're seeing deficits and, and that's really driven by this, this increase in the, in the fire contract. And we're not going to see any increase in services with that contract. That's going to be to stay status quo. Yeah. To keep station 12, uh, operating, which is, a. Uh, I think their standard is what four guys a shift, I believe. It could, uh, and and yeah, I mean that to keep Station Twelve operating and keep uh, the sort of regional presence that is Kern County uh, Fire and that station is important to the city, but it's also important to the surrounding areas um, because of the response model for the fire department. And um, yeah, it's it's a tough pill to swallow in terms of seeing a giant increase and really not having any say in how the service is delivered. And that was one that's that's been a little bit of a point of contention on that is because we've really tried to work with them and say, hey, let's let's figure out something that fits the city, uh, because we're a fairly small city in terms of people, in terms of geography, and uh, but it just because of the regional impact of, of that station, it, the cost is what the cost is according to the county of Kern. So it's one we're working through, and it's it's a tough one, and it really is driving this deficit. There's a lot of other things though, not only fire, but like I said, just the rising costs. The, uh, the need to have, you know, the police department, the need to take care of and maintain infrastructure is important. And doing all those things now just just cost more. And that, those are all major driving factors in this deficit that's projected after, after next year. And it was about a year ago that the county had come to us and the other cities, the mm -hmm. other incorporated cities, and said, there's going to be a change in your pricing structure. Yeah. And that's something that, 
it's we kind of saw this on the horizon and we've been working towards that and then I know, Corey, you've been directly involved in having conversations with the community through some different yeah. outreach. Can you talk about that just a little bit and what the response has been like? Because we really want to, I, I know that the number one goal is to make sure that we're providing the services that the community expects and demands. Yeah, so when you when that happened last year, uh, we, we in last year's budget meeting, we actually signed a contract with a consultant because we knew this was going to frankly happen due to the fire increase due to other increases on the horizon, unfunded mandates from the state, Sacramento money grabs, things that, that are coming out of our, your money and, and going to Sacramento. And so this, uh, this consultant has spent the better part of a year uh, talking to the community. We've done some community presentations. Greg's gone out to all the different community organizations and talked about this, talked about this budget basically that we adopted um, the other evening and, and, and there was a community survey. There's actually one still active on our website. We've, we've brought it up before, but live up to slash feedback. And it just asked people for the budget priorities. And so we took that and, um, really what you see in this budget reflects those priorities. Um, and that was maintaining fire fire actually, despite a big contract increase, um, residents believed that maintaining fire protection was very important and uh, maintaining local police and, and dispatch. We have the only local 911 dispatch in the 93561 area code. Outside of the city, you call 911, you're going to be sent most likely to uh, the sheriff's department in Bakersfield or the CHP in Bishop is where that dis dispatch center is, hours away. Uh, familiarity with the area, that sort of thing, not quite there. We have a local dispatch at the Tatchby Police Department and, uh, and great, uh, and great, I was going to say men and women, but it's all women that work in the dispatch center. Uh, and they do a phenomenal job. Um, and it's very important. I mean, it's busy. They get a lot of calls. And so those were some of the priorities and, and including even things uh, that scored very well on the surveys, you know, protecting drinking water. That means in our water funds, we've got some water rights purchases, that sort of thing, because water in the West has always been an issue. And so that was a, prior, a priority for residents. So a lot of that got folded into this. Um, but the consultant work is not done. Uh, their next job and task is to deliver another report to council that says, look, um, and the council brought this up in the budget meeting. And, and they said, we can't sustain and maintain what we're doing now based on these projections on this sort of revenue. What else can we do to generate revenue? And so that's what the next consultants reports. After a few more surveys will go out, um, most likely over the phone to uh, city residents, and they will report back to council what they believe is the best sort of path forward to generate revenue and solve some of these uh, issues that we see in the next few in the next few years. So that is to come probably the next month or so. Now, when we look at at this budget, and you you talk about the public's demand on public safety, we looked at those things internally. We talked to Chief Crager, and then in this budget, there were some things that were addressed for our police department and creating positions we didn't have before that there's mm -hmm. a necessity and some of it's to we've got a, a an assistant chief which is necessary and then i really liked seeing the civilian report taking like a technician is that yeah. with a, with a uh, and it's it's I, i'm familiar with this position mm -hmm. that is something that would alleviate officers having to go to and handle when it's a it's a non-in-progress yeah. type of thing it's a report kind of a call for service. I saw we're trying to really look at what the public is asking for, you know, and Chief Crager delivered, you know, some different options that were in the budget. Yeah. So, so we, we, in this budget, there's four extra positions for public safety added. So we've got the assistant police chief, a sergeant and two officer positions, but we do have the option um, in lieu of those two officer positions to kind of underfill with these public safety support specialists. So um, that's a new position we added to our salary schedule. We've got a job description approved that that Chief Crager uh, created. Um, and so it does give that option. Um, you know, I know one of the one of the difficulties right now is the hiring of officers. And so this just gives us a little bit more flexibility, um, you know, to, to hopefully, you know, get some of that work done, um, you know, with whatever positions we, we can find. Yeah, and a lot of these too, just to clear it up, because I, I know, so I, I don't want, I think a lot of other cities, larger cities have used these type of positions as a way to basically take armed and sworn police officers off the street. 
That's not what we're doing. Right. Well, we, wait, this is not a this is not a social worker coming to try to have you talk about your feelings. This is actually a position I know they're very common in uh, in the city of Bakersfield. Uh, I'll use a personal example. When I lived down there many years ago, my house was burglarized. They sent one of these folks over to take the report because they didn't need to send an officer because the burglar was no longer there. Yeah, there was no danger, no yeah, threat. Yeah, and so they went, they filed the report, what's missing, this and that. Okay, you know, we'll we'll follow up with you if there's anything to follow up on. So that would be sort of what this role would be. This would be somebody who could, if there was a property crime, they could write those reports and that sort of thing without necessarily having to take an officer off a of patrol to go do that that report and tie up that resource. So yeah, exactly. Just right. to be clear, I don't want people thinking that we're just putting trying to put social workers on the street and take off take out officers. No, this yeah. is more of an officer who is going to do some of that more administrative role on the street. Yeah, and it's a civilian officer, not a sworn officer. So yeah. this this person is definitely someone who can alleviate, like you said, a sworn officer from having to do something. Not that as a cop, you want to go out and you want to be involved in whatever is and talk to people, yeah. right, and be active. But sometimes you got to take the hey, this doesn't require you to be here. We yeah. can gather information without having a full-time sworn police officer. And that's what I think it frees that full-time officer to handle other crimes, whether it's in progress or be visibly present to be a crime deterrent. Mm -hmm. So it gives chief and the Tachby Police Department options. So I'm glad that we've got that as a recognized position. We don't have those positions filled, but at least they're now recognized as a part of this budget with potential, you know, should uh, the need address itself yeah and i think you know as we as we move forward we will like i said more to come in the next month on a lot of these sort of recommendations from the consultant but uh you know really trying to put the reality out there too that um we use public safety as an example you know we live in a state that has decriminalized a lot and that's led to a lot of increased contacts uh with our with our officers and officers statewide because Folks are a revolving door. They're in, they're booked, they're released, they're back out. They're not getting treatment for their drug problems or their mental health issues. And so they're back on the street. They're committing property crimes and sometimes violent crimes. And so therefore, there's more of a strain on police resources, which led to an issue in hiring police officers as well. Um, and so working with Chief Crager, the the point was we, we, we need to sort of buck that trend and let's invest in our, in our police department and our public safety and really create a self-sustaining model. And, and that's really our push, and that's rather, that's been a push to with some of the consultant work that's been done here in the last year or so. Is is what is a, what what's going to take to make Tatchby self sufficient, uh, so we can so we don't have to necessarily worry about Sacramento taking you know RDA tax money. That's another thing that is in the budget. There's a weird little dip in in property taxes is because well it's an RDA timing issue, but some of that money that was assessed it used to go to downtown and and the RDA the redevelopment agency areas. The state took those away. Those property taxes are still being paid, but they're going to Sacramento. They're not coming to the city to help build downtown like we did um, and, and make it. You know, I can't imagine. Downtown's great. It's phenomenal. I grew up here. It was, frankly, a dump when I grew up here, and it's beautiful now. It, I can't imagine what it would look like had the RDA not been taken away from us and all the many more projects we could have done. Um, but that money still goes to, to Sacramento. So. The point is trying to figure out what makes us self-sufficient so we don't have to worry about um, outside factors, whether that's the federal government, county, or, or, or state, which is a big case most of the time. Well, let's talk about the, the unfunded mandates. And we hear that word a lot as we walk the halls of City Hall. And when we talk about unfunded mandates, what types of things, these are things that are coming down from the state that are, it's not a suggestion. It, the word <laughs> right. shall is being used and you shall do this. But there isn't, when we say unfunded, it means there's no back funding. There's no grant okay. to, just to tell pay you to for do this. it. Yeah. There's an A, B or an S, B that was passed that told, told you to yeah. do it. Hamed, what kind of impact are these things that are coming down being forced upon you know, the city of Tehachapi and, and, and other municipalities, what kind of an impact does that have when we're laying out our budget? So, you know, th there's, there's capital, there's operating impacts, um, you know, some of the capital staff things, time. Yeah. Staff time as well. I mean, so, you know, just starting with some of the, let's start with COVID sick leave, you know, I mean, we, we did get some funding from the federal, you know, on the federal level, um, you know, to help us out with that when kind of COVID first hit, but then you had these other rounds and then the state comes down 
says you've got to provide this COVID sick leave and yet they're not providing any funding for it. So it's got to come from somewhere. And so it ends up coming from our general fund, our water fund, you know, all these funds that, that have to cover this, these, these accruals of time, you know, that, that we've got a grant, you know, uh, because of the pandemic. And you're double, you're double paying people basically. So uh, let's, I'll use a police officer, for example, right. Or or even somebody who works in the wastewater treatment plant or public works, uh, anyone who's basically overtime eligible, okay? So let's say that person, 14 days, whether they had COVID or not, suspected they had COVID, 14 days, which is fine. Obviously, you don't want them working with COVID. However, there was the state says you got to give them that time off. They don't have to use their own time. You'll provide this 14 days that they can use. Well, then we need to put a police officer on the street. We need somebody at the wastewater treatment plant to make sure it's operating. So then somebody gets paid overtime to cover that. So you're paying somebody overtime plus somebody's getting paid to not be here because there's no using of their other accruals. And so those types of things, I mean, those were, that was a, a big one. And the state extended that on a couple of occasions without any funding to back it up. Yep, That's it. And then when you come to some of the capital equipment, like public works, I mean, you know, they've got equipment that's not that old, that still has a lot of life yet. Um, but yet they're being forced to purchase new equipment because of these regulations that are being, you know, forced down. So, you know, that's just more expenses, you know, that we that we have to incur um, just to satisfy these regulations. I think in the last five years, we replaced a street sweeper, a dump truck, and then this year we've got budgeted a front-end loader, all of which I think the street, street sweeper was a little older uh, and was kind of running towards end of life, uh, but was still probably, you know, usable. Uh, the dump truck certainly was good, and the front-end loader was certainly good, but because of changing diesel emission standards, in the state, those were deemed to be not acceptable anymore. Now, what's going to happen and what happened in the past, we will put those on a public site. They will get purchased by somebody out of state. They will take them to their state where they will live a happy life operating as a perfectly good piece of equipment. Um, but yet the taxpayers had to foot the bill for a new one here. And meanwhile, someone's going to pick it up on the cheap and take it out of state and operate it. And we have no option. No. It, no. it has to be done. Thou shalt do this. And then they start throwing fines if you don't. So... <laughs> and then there's the staff time piece too on top of it all i mean uh sb 1383 uh this is the organics we've talked about that a little bit um i spend way too much time on trash and recycling i really have better things to do than worry about trash and recycling and it's not so much dealing with the local contract with wm it's dealing with the state regulations and people that that have requirements of what you can and can't put in your trash can and what we as the city, waste management as our hauler, must do to get make sure that stuff doesn't go to the landfill um, and, 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 and cause pollution, according to uh, their studies, is 1383, was methane. Although methane makes up a very, very, very tiny percentage of pollutants in the air because it is technically a pollutant, therefore bad. And so we've got to revamp. And there's no funding for that. So... In a couple years' time, there's a there's a chance we've tried to push it off as much as possible because of just the feasibility of it. But trash rates will go up quite a bit to cover this third bin to put green waste, food waste, that sort of thing in. Not just your yard clippings, but they want apple you know apple cores and banana peels and lettuce and leftovers and stuff thrown anything that can create a gas to be thrown in and picked up on a weekly basis. Um, and so just dealing with those regulations and reporting back what goes what doesn't go to the landfill um i have to file an annual report every year with cal recycle on on what goes into the landfill what you know how much tonnage was diverted how many bottles and cans were recycled um and, and that takes time and frankly time that i would rather do other things and i'm pretty sure the the, the taxpayers would rather have me do other things because this is it's time consuming. And I'm just a small example. There's a ton of those all across the city staff and the city staffs across the state um, that, that are having to deal with these unfunded mandates on the staff side. Unfunded mandates. I think that's going to be a word that's continually used, mm-hmm. but I think it's a better explanation. We don't have a choice. Yeah. We have to do that. $10,000 a day is the fine if you're not compliant. And we're not fully compliant with 1383 yet. We've got sort of a blessed sort of we'll get there eventually plan. Um, But if we were just to say, nope, we're not going to do it, we'd be facing a $10,000 a day fine. And they do that by keeping your your, your revenue. They'll just keep revenue from you, which is not not an option for us. Now, as we look at our projected future budgets, do we anticipate additional unfunded mandates? Or, I mean, 
I mean, that's really kind of a we're pulling things out of the air at that point. Each legislative section, uh, each legislative session brings a new surprise. Is I guess the only way to put it. Yeah, I mean, it, it just seems like out of the blue, all of a sudden, there's some order that comes down from Sacramento that says you will do this, and there's no money to do that. Yeah. You just figure it out. I know we we budget very conservatively. Can we budget conservatively enough for these unfu- <laughs> pr- potential un- additional unfunded mandates? Because, I mean, is there an end in sight for them? I don't think so. I mean, I, I just this, I, I don't, I think in this state, probably not. It's tough. I mean, when you have a full time legislature and they spend a lot of time, and we will get phone calls from people that say, hey, you need anything written into law this year? And our answer is always like, no. We're, but there are a lot of people that just they write and consider new laws constantly, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you may see some agencies sometimes will have like a contingency line item, um, you know, in a way that's kind of a way of you know kind of stashing maybe some extra pot of money for those unforeseen things. Now we don't have something like that, but I think it just speaks to the importance of having reserves and having good reserves because. You know, the reserves are for those unforeseen circumstances. And so you could say some of these future mandates, unfunded mandates coming down that we're, we don't know yet, but they likely may come. You know, that's why it's important to have these strong reserves. And, and we can't rely on those reserves either. I, I think I think if someone looked at the budget and would say, well, why are why is the city of Tatchaby crying the blues in the next four years because of a million dollar deficit when there's, you know, this year, 13 million in the bank. But if you look at the cross those five years, that thirteen million by year five of this preliminary budget drops to seven point eight. Well, that's half the reserves just gone. Yeah, it's not sustainable. It's not smart. It's not a smart way to do yeah. business. Not a smart way to live your personal finances. You don't want to be spending, you know, a fifty percent of your 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 savings in in the next five years. It's, right. You know, when your household, you wouldn't do that. Certainly, wouldn't do it in a municipal corporation. Yeah, and that's a fixed cost. That's not going to change for the when we talk about the fire increase. Mm-hmm. That is not going to change. It's not going to come down. They've said it's set in stone. They've done all their surveys and they say, this is what each community is going to pay. And this was the bill that's being sent to the city. And we continue to look at at, at options. The council has directed, uh, there's a couple members of a committee, Mayor Smith, Mayor Pro Tem Davies, um, are are sort of in a a committee about and, and tasked us with looking into additional options. And look, Kern County Fire, the firefighters, fantastic. They do a great job. Um, and, and there, there, it's not, this is not an indication of any, about the level of service, the quality of service. Um, but we have to ultimately look at what's best for the residents in the city. It happened years ago with the Kern County Sheriff's department into the Tehachapi police department and, uh, bringing the police department back is repeated often as the best decision that was ever made. Um, and especially given the state of, of policing these days. And so the same goes with fire. We're looking at, uh, at different models and it could be, Hey, current County fire moving forward uh, for a long time. And we, we create a, a model that works for us or there could be hybrid models, that sort of thing out there. Uh, I've learned a lot about the fire service business in the last, in the last year or so as well. Um, and so we just look at you know, the best, the best options moving forward with the resources we have available. So are we are we calling this an unfunded mandate? <laughs> I guess in a way it's not from the state, but from the county. Yeah, I mean they're the ones that are providing the fire service, and if yeah. we want that fire service, yeah, this is what it costs. Yeah, now. and it was a tough one. Mayor Smith pointed out quite a bit. You know, when this contract was first signed many years ago, when we had the Tatchaby Fire Department, uh, Kern County had a desire to be a regional fire department. Uh, they didn't want gaps in their service by having cities with their own when they had a station just outside the city limits. And so they said, Hey, let's, we want to build a regional response force. So we'll we'll contract with us. We'll be your service provider. And then by the way, we'll be providing service, which they still do to places like Rosemond, uh, Mojave station 12 in Tatchby. We'll go there on calls. Um, And so mayor Smith said, I think at the time sounds like a great plan. I don't know how long this plan will be good, but it worked well as, as leadership changes at the County level, um, and, and the people doing the, the budgeting change their philosophies. That's kind of gone out the window now. And now it's pointed to as, and the unfortunate term of subsidies was being used that we were being, the city was being subsidized for our fire protection service when that was a contract we signed many years ago. But um, now it's more of a full cost recovery. Well, it costs this much to operate station 12 in the city. This is what you need to pay us. So it was kind of a bait and switch on, uh, 
on the contract that was and the contract that we have now. It's I, well, I don't want to say it's mind boggling because it's not, but it's uh, it's something we have to chew on. I mean, yeah. this this is something that's on the plate. It's not going away, and it's going to have to be addressed. Yeah. So as we look towards the future over the next in, in the projected budgets, what was the total when, once we get out to year five or six on this? What what it's what's the total amount of increase we're going to see for the the fire cost? So the contract cost was up two hundred and two percent, and the payment, the extra payment that actually comes from the general fund to cover that is up 6,700%. Um, and so just again, big increases, but, um, and then the dollar amounts, you know, that equates to, we're up to 2.2 million on that future, you know, in the six year on the fire contract. Okay. And even that 6,700% is sort of a, a budgeted estimate because that property taxes is allocated and there's a, expectation that'll go up a little bit each year as properties are bought and sold they're reassessed um but if something happens if another one of these weird meteors hits and uh and and the property values change well that could change that number so the actual subsidy from the general fund could be even higher um so that's what you know we look at as well it's something to take into account hamed when we look at the like the gas tax and we see this we know where gas now is at six plus dollars a gallon. I think diesel's over seven dollars a gallon. Some I'm, places, yeah. It, that is it too soon to see the numbers that that come in from, you know, the gas tax revenue, or are people driving less, or are they still driving the same, and we're seeing an increase in that? I'm I'm kind of curious as to that because it's like I know I've changed my driving habits, so even though I'm paying more for gas, I'm driving less. So I know I'm probably paying probably about the same in my my gas tax or maybe even a little bit less because I've really curved where I go. Yeah, I mean, we we use our projections. We get a lot of the data uh, from League of California Cities and some other, you know, um, state resources that have their projections. You know, we, we take that into account. But again, we try to be conservative because of those types of things. We're not sure, you know, yet, although the the prices have gone up, but is the use going to go down, you know? And so I think we, we tend to still be conservative on our revenues, even for gas tax. Um, you know, they have been, the actuals have been increasing, but is that going to continue into the future? You know, those are the things we, you know, we, we can't predict, but we want to be conservative just in case we don't aim too high. And we see an awful lot more Teslas out there yeah. driving. So a lot less gas is getting purchased by uh, people in those electric cars that are motoring up and down the, the highways. Yeah, and some of those gas tax monies, especially this specific SB1, that you'll see that in the budget, uh, that part portion of the gas tax is actually very limited. It's kind of like its own little enterprise fund where that money can only be used on specific projects, road projects. Every year we have to basically tell the state, we're going to use it on this, and we can't use it on your neighborhood street. So you live on C Street. We can't necessarily pave C Street with that money because C Street doesn't get enough vehicle volume for sb1 to bless it uh so the the crazy part is too you're paying this additional tax to the state and the state yes is giving a portion of that back but then they're giving it back with strings attached uh saying you must use it on these certain volume roads so it doesn't necessarily mean that we can do your neighborhood because frankly there are plenty of streets in the city in the neighborhoods that need treatment and the revenue is just not there especially because you can't use the sb1 funds for it so Okay, so then when we look at projects like Public Works with what they did this past year in rehabilitating some streets, that funding that Public Works puts in to do that, that comes from the general fund? Some of that. So there, yeah, there's a few different funding sources. So there's a streets and roads fund you know, that has some, some limited revenues that goes towards your kind of normal maintenance and, and operating expenditures for streets and roads. When you get into these bigger capital projects, you know, they, you know, our public works director come up with a plan, you know, kind of a 10 year plan of, and identifying streets and, and doing an annual, you know, repaving or rehab of these. Um, and that was going to include, you know, another 350000 annually from the general fund. Um, but we had to take that out of this year's budget because of the, the potential deficits that we're seeing and, and the challenges. And so, you know, that was an example of something that, you know, would be very valuable to the city, but we had to take out um, just to balance the budget this year. So what should have been $700,000 in road 
rehab money basically was cut to 350 uh, and SB1 was was going to be used to fill that. So um, some of those projects will not will, just won't get done this year because of that that switch. And that doesn't change the uh, the need. Yeah. But it's something we had to identify. And it's, you know, it's just you've got to look at you be responsible. You look across your bottom line and you have to identify the priorities. Mm -hmm. And the community has said that public safety is the number one priority. Yeah. yeah. That making sure that we maintain water, sustainable water is a number one priority. Yeah. So those And maintaining are, infrastructure in general. Yeah. I mean, the, the public's not looking for us to go out and build bigger, better everything. They don't need streets paved in gold. Uh, they want what we have maintained. Right. And so that is that was an overwhelming sort of response to some of the surveys that went out and will be echoed, I think, in the next sort of reports that are released in the next month or so. Okay. So anything that in the budget that you think that would be important to share that we haven't talked about yet, that we not cover, or I'm trying to think myself as Joe Citizen, you know, what am I thinking? I, I, I've answered some of my, you've answered my questions, you know, that I've had about, it helps me to understand that these enterprise funds, and then we look at a $34 million budget, 12 million is the general fund. And these, uh, the, what makes up the, the remaining $34 million are in and out accounts, you know, bills that come in, but they're paid directly out, you know, so the money comes in from a water bill, mm -hmm. it goes right back in to maintain that infrastructure. There's no profit involved in that. It's built basically what we're regulated to do, right? Charge for what the service costs. And there's not a, hey, we can pad it. Let's let's put that away for a rainy day. That's you want not some there. money put away for when something breaks, yeah. it can be replaced. That's why well, they look at the future. That's why those funds that. have usually a healthy balance. That way, if something, if a water line breaks or a main breaks, which happens, um, that can get replaced and there's no need to go out and try to find funding. Right. Yeah. I think one thing I want to point out is, you know, I think a, a common thing you hear sometimes with, with residents is, you know, why didn't you go after grant money? Why didn't you go out and get some of the, some of this other money out there? And, and I think from my experience, you know, coming from city of Palmdale and then even Bear Valley is, you know, and now to city of Tatchby is the amount of grants that the city does pursue and successfully gets and, and puts that money to work. I mean, it's a, I think kudos, you know, to all the departments, but in, you know, our development services department for identifying these grants, um, doing what it takes to go out and competitively get these grants and then put it to work. And you see a lot of these projects throughout the city that are really improving the city. So, you know, that work is being done out there, you know, grants, they, there's sometimes strings attached and sometimes you've got to, you know, provide some matches and that's a component, you know, there's a general fund match, um, you know, to the airport grant, um, you know, that we think is worthy of, of doing. And, um, you know, there's some, there's some good capital projects out there, you know, that are going to provide some good improvements to the city and, and we're getting grant money to do it. And I think, and you kind of stressed earlier, and we'd have a, we've done a grant show where we've talked about the grants mm -hmm. is that grants are reimbursed. So you have to have that capital in reserve to be able to pay bills as they come in and to take care of whatever this project. If we say we look at the Snyder rehabilitation of improving the roads, the curbs and the gutters, the sidewalks, making it safer for the two kids. different grants combined. Yeah. But we had to pay for services by the vendors, the contractors to and then even our we augmented that with public works going out and doing some work to try. Yeah. And cut once in a while we'll go, well, while we're here, let's pave this little portion because, and we'll pay, we'll foot the bill on that to be able to pay. Maybe there's a side street that attaches. Well, why do, or even the alley rehabilitation that was done. Snyder was redone. And so some of the alleys got sort of a rehab facelift that we, we funded that way it made the whole project a little bit better. And then once we're done with that and we sign all of the, the finished work orders, then we start to see we can apply to get the grant money in. It's not like we get it if it's a, a million dollar project. We don't get a million dollars to put in an escrow account that we can get to. That agency holds on to that money. We have to have the liquidity in our assets to be able to pay for whatever the bills are. So there's some communities that don't have that flexibility. Right. So having a healthy reserve, as we kind of mentioned, there's a reason for it. And it's allowed us to we get reimbursed for that money, but you have to outlay it first. That's and, right. And and that kind of even ties in kind of the conversation we had about the investments and the investment policy and cash flow. And that's, those are the things I'm looking at too, is that we don't want to just, 
invest all the money in something that's gonna not going to mature for a few years because we may need to put that money, we may need to spend it first and then get reimbursed from you know these agencies for grants. So that's all part of the cash flow of looking and making sure that we have the liquidity and that's why it's so important. So trying to be as responsible yeah. as we can with uh, the tax dollars and hopefully this conversation has helped understand what we're doing as we do it. And this is something that we just took to council. We had the workshop. There were some great questions that that came, you know, from the audience, which was a reporter. We were able to answer. The council had questions. And at the end of this conversation, we're happy that in 2022 slash 2023, this next fiscal year, July 1 through June 30 of 23, that we do have a balanced budget. But we do did identify there are going to be some issues coming forward. And we got some cool projects too. I mean, coming up this next year in terms of the grant for the Pinion Road extension, that's going to happen. There's some road rehab being done, uh, kind of uh, piggybacking on the Snyder project from the last year right. in that area, some road rehab being done there as well. And a few other spots that we've taken to council recently. So there's a lot of uh, maintenance projects that will happen and, and the good improvement on, on Pinion. Um, so there's, there are some things it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. And I think, I think really I'd, I'd sum this all up by saying there's there's challenges in the future. Um, but look, go back in the history of Tashby, you know, and, and pretty soon I think we'll have a podcast coming out about, you know, the 75th anniversary of the Tashby earthquake um, or COVID. Like we're going to find a way like we're, we're going to find a way uh, to get through it. We're going to meet that challenge. Uh, the community's already helped with some feedback uh, and, and they'll be more involved in, in the next round as well. So, we're, we're going to figure it out. It's not it's not the end of the world. Well, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that we, we have some long-term vision. We're not just chasing a dollar to chase a dollar. We look at what does that dollar really cost? Mm -hmm. Is that dollar with having to maintain something worth chasing when you're going to spend $100 to maintain that one? Yeah. Okay, and we, we start to look ahead of ourselves, and that's why we're able to identify, you know, some potential things that are coming with having that vision of, okay, we're not satisfied with just 365 days. Oh, hold on a second. What happened? We've got a hundred percent increase, you know, in a, uh, in a contract. We didn't see that coming. No, we, we do. And that's what we're talking about and, yeah. and addressing it and figuring out ways to work through these, you know, bumps in the road or the increased costs of whatever, everything. I mean, I know it at home when I look at my personal budget, everything seems to have gone up mm -hmm. dramatically. So, and that's across the board when you're talking about projects, asphalt, whatever yeah. the materials are, everything, the cost to deliver these products, everything has gone up. So those are things that we are identifying and making sure that we are addressing it appropriately, you know, and having open conversation about it. Yeah. I think we've got a phenomenal team. Uh, we've got a phenomenal community that can help. And I think we're, we're going to, we're going to figure it out. I think it will be, there will be a solution out there. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get it done. It's just, this is what is going to happen. So there's no doubt. And now question, I mean, just, it just popped into my head was when we were talking about the grants. So if we've got a, a million dollar grant, that is a part of the budget and we're going to have, so it's going to be a million in a million out, well, a million out. And then it comes back in kind of, kind of the reverse order of that, um, does, is that, factor into the general fund or does that factor into like a capital projects enterprise fund? What, how does, where does the, the grant money factor in out of the 34 million that we've got on an, on this upcoming annual basis? If we just had a, just for the example, a, a $1 million grant, where would that, I guess if it's in the water department, if there was a grant for that, it would factor into the water budget. Yeah. So real ultimately it's going to tie into where, where's the expenditure going to, or okay. what's it for? You know, if it's if it's to buy a, an asset for a particular department or a particular fund, then that's where, you know, the expenditure is going to be. And that's where you're going to want to match the revenues, too. So okay. if it's a water uh, fund expenditure or, or infrastructure or something like that, and we found some funding uh, through a grant, then that grant would be, you know, we'd place the revenue for it in the same water fund. Okay. And so there could be general fund, you know, grants that go into the general fund if that's where the expenditure is being recorded. Um, and, and same thing in the airport fund, you know, all of that. So 
Um, it just depends on where that expenditure okay. is happening. Light bulb is now on. I can now <laughs> see in the room that, that that makes total sense. It goes back to, I repeat this a lot, it goes back to, you know, uh, I had a professor. Uh, I, it wasn't the, you know, I wouldn't didn't go to the illustrious UCLA like my friend Hamid <laughs> here did. Uh, but uh, a, a, a public administration professor at CSU Bakersfield just retired this year, Dr. Tomas Martinez. And he always said the number one rule of public administration is it depends. <laughs> uh, that is the that is the answer, the standard answer, because it depends. And that's the answer to your question, too. It's like, well, it depends. Where's the fund coming? Where's the project coming from? You know, what's yeah. it going to? And it so, makes total sense. But, you know, I didn't, I guess think that far into it just say okay we've got grant money but it, yeah well, it's got to factor in but where exactly does it factor and then we like, don't have a grant column that just say does that, it say grants right yeah, here's all the grants grant in fund. and grants out yeah so that's how it gets factored in and then it's good to have on, that additional funding to i don't know how many times we've had a grant and you know jay has said well why will well, while we're here let's finish the sidewalk because how many spots in tehachapi have you does the sidewalk end well, this happened, this this was done 50 years ago when the developer, whatever the time, just stopped building the sidewalk. That's all they were required to then. Well, now we go back with a with a project and we're like, well, let's let's try to fill that. Even though we got a grant maybe for this sidewalk gap, but there's a gap a few more feet away that's not covered in the grant. Let's just, let's just go finish that sidewalk. And there's a lot of times we'll do that sort of while we're here, let's, let's improve or fix this too. Um, and so that's where some of that capital comes in. And it makes sense because it saves money in the long run. Yeah. In yeah, the short run and twice. the long run. Yeah, you don't got to mobilize twice. And while, while a contractor's here, might as well do that too. Okay. Well, I feel very much more informed. <laughs> and I sat through the, the budget hearing. And now as getting to ask, you know, questions as I'm starting to really kind of chew on it and, and think about it. So it's helped me. So hopefully it's helped the listener too. Yeah. Anything else that you think that would be important to add in? that we haven't talked about? No, just, you know, I want to point out it, it's been great being a part of the team. You know, you always have a budget team and, and it's a good collaborative effort. Um, it's a good system in place here and ultimately providing transparency. Um, you know, our PowerPoint presentation had 65 slides, you know, and, and it's, we've got, you know, fund by fund by fund. You know, we try to give all the information that would help the reader understand the resident understand and we've got charts data you know all of that so um it was really a good process to be a part of and just looking forward to addressing these challenges and into the future well i know for me the, like some of the information you would see on one page was delivered one format and then on the next page it was in a different format and it helps me because i'm i'm more of a visual learner i like the pie charts and those yeah. things speak to me versus maybe looking at the spreadsheet but then when you look at the two of them together you go Okay, I get it. Okay, it makes sense. So, you know, and if there's anyone in the public that would like to review the budget, we have that on the website. Yeah, right Right now. So what was submitted, it was part of the agenda. Um, and so I think that's... I'm, that's on the... Yep. You can go to the website and get that. Click on agendas um, and special meeting for June 6th. Yeah, yeah. And so now the next steps for finance department is, and we've already been doing on it, but is working on the budget document book itself. And so there's a lot more supporting documentation that goes into our actual budget document. And so we're going to be working on that over the next month. Um, and once we get that done, we'll submit it for awards. You know, there's best practices that we're trying to satisfy and meet. Um, we get scored on that and it just kind of helps ensure that we're doing everything we can, you know, to promote transparency and, and readability by the public. And so, once we get that final budget document done, that will definitely be posted to the website as well. Yeah, and the past ones are there. You want to look up ones from last year. Those those are there as well. And uh, yeah, it's been. I think, I think uh, Hamid and Greg and I went through this presentation about seven times. I think to you know just to get yeah. And let's not use this chart. Let's use this chart. Let's tweak this chart. Make it eat more. You can read it easier and that sort of thing. And just going through this uh, to make sure it was presented well so the council and the public can understand. And, um, yeah, it was uh, – I, I told the story before we started, and I'll tell it again right now, is when – couple years ago greg said i want you to be more involved in the budget process and i'm like okay yeah that sounds great careful what you wish for <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no it's been it's been super enlightening to go through this and now understand i think this year was the biggest year where i'm like wow i remembered stuff i think i'm actually bringing value to the conversation for once <laughs> i remember things from a couple years ago and so yeah it gets uh, it's a little easier every year well very good well, Ahmed, thank you for joining us and taking the time. Uh, I know you're 
you know, you're new to the city, new being coming on this year, and you inherited Hannah Chung's department, her role, the things that, and you've got to kind of work your way in and see how things have been done, but you've adapted very quickly. It seems like it was a seamless transition for us. Yeah. You know, so, you know, welcome aboard officially here on, on air. And I just appreciate the the time and effort that you put in and welcome to being on a podcast. Thank you. Appreciate it. It was, it was fun. I enjoyed it. Thank and, you. And Hamid has a great team uh, of folks that have been working tirelessly on this thing. They yeah. continue to work because now it's adopted. They got to put the document together, as he said. So uh, kudos to them and, and all the work they put into this. It's well, going. And Corey, anything you want to add in closing? Nope. I think, uh, I think we covered it. It was a lot. Um, and I think, I think the podcast is almost about as long as a budget meeting, Hamid. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, I think it was good though. It was a, a lot covered, but if you do have questions, you can email them to us here at media at Tehachapi We'd be happy to answer them. Or if you've got questions about the budget, I'm sure Hamed would be very yeah. Happy to answer those because I include, will be forwarding. Can you include the <laughs> podcast in your budget presentation, like document for an award? I don't know. I'm just saying. Hey, I mean, we this is. Do you want to talk about budget transparency? And we literally did a podcast discussing the budget. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm just saying. We're still not out there. That's a good idea. We'll, we'll look and we'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll send those questions to media at tehachapicityhall.com. We appreciate the time you spend with us here at Tehachapod. If you do have a show thought or idea. You can also send that to us here at that uh, same email. And we'll catch you again real soon right here on Tehachapod. Tehachapod is a conversation about Tehachapi designed for the people who live here or who would like to know more about this mountaintop community. If you have a question you would like answered, email media at tehachapicityhall.com. We will try to answer it on a future episode of Tehachapod.